Welcome to the Saving Lives Podcast. I'm Eddie Joe. Today, we're going to be discussing an article that was published in 2022 in the Journal of Critical Care that is titled, The Incidence of Propofol Infusion Syndrome in Critically Ill Patients. I have it right here on my iPad. As always, hat tip to the authors, read these data for yourself, and this is not medical advice on how to treat your patients. This is just my interpretation of this article. Again, hat tip to the authors. Quick plug for my book, The Vasopressor and Inotrope Handbook, which is available on Amazon and is also available on my Shopify store. If you purchase the book directly from me, I'll go ahead and personalize it and sign it for you. So thank you for your support. Now let's go ahead and get started with this article. Those of us who work in the intensive care unit use propofol, I guess, every single day. I mean, I know I use it every single day, and it is a very, very effective sedative. It is easy to titrate on. It is easy to titrate off. But I do like to remind folks that this is not a medication that is used for pain. So if you're using somebody for, if you have somebody who you need to sedate and they're intubated and they're just on propofol, make sure you're taking care of their pain with some other form of analgesia because propofol is not cutting it. Now, there is an adverse effect of propofol, which is this propofol infusion syndrome, P-R-I-S. I always thought it was propofol-related infusion syndrome, but I guess I'm wrong. And the reasons why it happens is either patients are on propofol for a prolonged period of time, or they are on high doses of propofol, in which case many institutions have a threshold as to how high you could go for exactly this reason, to avoid this clinical manifestation, which causes a lot of harm to patients. Because amongst things it causes include metabolic acidosis, cardiac dysfunction, rhabdo, hypertriglyceridemia, and acute kidney injury. From a historical perspective, this condition was first described in the late 1990s, and it's thought to be underdiagnosed because a lot of other illnesses that we take care of in the intensive care unit also cause a metabolic acidosis, cardiac dysfunction, rhabdo, and acute kidney injury. So what these authors tried to do was to see if they could provide more of a clear picture as to what propofol-related infusion syndrome is. I'll call it PRIS moving forward, as well as its associated risk factors and you know how that all behaves in our critically ill patients. From an overview perspective, this was a retrospective multi-hospital observational cohort study, meaning that you know these patients weren't blinded or anything like that. And it took place at NYU between March of 2020 to February of 2021. Something curious was happening in the world of healthcare during, during these months, but uh, that's neither here nor there. And what they did was that they included 654 adult ICU patients who received, and this, these are the key characteristics here, the propofol infusion for at least 48 hours or at a dose of greater than 16 micrograms per kilogram per minute for 24 hours. So in other words, prolonged duration or high doses. And the high dose here was 60 micrograms per kilogram per minute. At my institution, we have a cap of, of 50 that you could use. Sometimes you go a little bit higher, but for the most part, it's not sustainable. So the primary outcome was the incidence of PRIS, and they defined that by using major features such as metabolic acidosis and cardiac dysfunction with at least two minor features. And these, this is where you have the hypertriglyceridemia or the rhabdo. With regards to the secondary outcomes, they included pris-associated mortality as well as hospital length of stay. So what did these authors find? This is what we're here. First of all, let's discuss the incidence. They found that the incidence was 2.9% of patients. It's not very high when you think about just 19 out of 654, but at the same time, we put propofol on so many patients, or better yet, better said, we put so many patients on propofol that 2.9% is something that we do run into every now and then if we were to use these doses. But even though it's uncommon, again, we, it's something we could still run into. With regards to mortality, and here they looked at PRIS-associated mortality, the rate of mortality when these patients had PRIS was 94.7%. But then again, this is these are patients who are critically ill, so if you're on propofol at that high a dose or for that long, chances are something that's, something's wrong with you that's you know, possibly lethal. But they went ahead and they defined 
pris specific mortality, which was death occurring within seven days of the onset of pris. And this was 36.8%, which is still pretty significant. They were able to tease out a couple of risk factors for developing pris. Here, for example, they found that the median propofol dose in pris patients was just 36.4 micrograms per kilogram per minute. And it was administered over a mean duration, excuse me, a median duration of 147 hours. Now, they did observe hypertriglyceridemia as well as acute kidney injury in all of the PRIS patients. So keep, uh, keep your eyes open for patients' triglyceride levels because this could be indicative that something bad is going to happen. I know that we at our institution regularly check triglyceride levels every couple of days to ensure that this is not brewing in the background. So something to keep that in mind. Now, the metabolic acidosis, I would have figured occurred in all the patients, but it didn't. It only occurred in 78.9% of patients. And the cardiac dysfunction occurred in 52.6% of patients. So that means we got to keep an eye on these different things. You know, the hypertriglyceridemia, acute kidney injury, metabolic acidosis, and cardiac dysfunction. From a clinical manifestation standpoint, the hallmark signs of PRIS per this study were the hypertriglyceridemia as well as the rhabdo. So checking patients' CPK or CK, depending on what you check in your institution, could be worthwhile to help you identify if the patient is going to PRIS. Now, the hypertriglyceridemia occurred at a median of 4.6 days after starting propofol, and the triglyceride levels exceeded 482. So it's a pretty high triglyceride level. We tend to stop it if the triglyceride levels are over 300, we go ahead and we switch our sedative agent. And rhabdo was noted in 26.3% of PRIS patients. Now, these patients, from an outcome standpoint, obviously you have to fix this underlying, you have to fix this issue, excuse me. And so these patients had a, a higher length of stay. However, some of them had a shorter length of stay because they unfortunately passed. So all in all, what do we do with these data and with our utilization of propofol? Well, first of all, we need to think about the doses of propofol as well as the duration of propofol that we use in our patients. And if we have no choice because we don't want to use benzodiazepines in our patients, we just need to monitor them by checking either triglyceride levels, not either, but you could check them all. You could check their triglyceride levels on certain periods of time. You, so, you should also check to see if they're going into rhabdo by checking CK or CPK on random intervals of time, depending on your institution. But most, most of all, you should just try to avoid using such high doses for such a prolonged period of time of propofol. From a lab perspective also, you know, one of the things I keep a close eye on on my patients' BMP on their basic metabolic panel or their CMP, comprehensive metabolic panel, is that I look at their serum bicarb, which is the CO2 that you see there. If that number is, let's say, let's say it's below 20, my mind is starting to spin a little bit as to wondering why this patient has a metabolic acidosis and how could we go about fixing it. So, <clears throat> Again, what's important about the study to wrap this up is that it sheds light on all these factors about propofol infusion syndrome. The incidence, again, is 2.9%, which doesn't sound like a lot, but when you make it relevant to how many hundreds of patients, even thousands of patients we take care of every year in our intensive care unit, it, it means it does show its face every now and then, unfortunately. So I'd like to know what you think and how have you seen propofol infusion syndrome? How have you guys taken care of it? What do you do at your institution to make sure that this pathology does not come to say hello? And um, yeah, just give me your generalized thoughts. All in all, thank you for tuning in to my podcast, the Saving Lives Podcast. I wish you all a very happy holidays, a Merry Christmas, Happy Hanukkah. Um, definitely a happy new year. It's a new new year. New year, new me. What's it that the kids say? Anyway. Um, I wish you all the best. Thank you for your support. Thank you for making 2024 a success. I'm looking forward to seeing you guys in 2025 out in conferences and such. Definitely check out my book, the Vasopressor and Inotrope Handbook, and pick up a copy if you haven't already. Oh, by the way, um, I should have said this earlier, but if you purchase a copy of the book by listening to this podcast, type in the code podcast into the into the checkout box, and obviously this needs to be 
on my personal store and you'll save an additional 10% off the book. Thank you so much, guys. Have a great day. Bye.